uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here with you, and I'm always interested in, interested in promoting my field of study because I feel passionate about it, and I want more people to to know about it. So let me start by asking you a question: uh, Who do you think is a scientist, a researcher? How would you define a researcher? Ideas? Somebody who tries to discover new things on their on their like level, uh, they 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 specialize. Yes, I I I think I should uh, agree with that, and uh, this quote from Albert Einstein. Um, is very well suited. Uh, he said, if we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research. So, uh, by definition, research is trying to find answers to the questions uh, which do not necessarily have an answer, and we really don't know what we are doing when, when we are doing research. Yeah? So, networking is research. <laughs> That's the key, the topic I teach in this class, network networks. So, what do you say, Sergei? Is this uh, research we're doing here? Yeah? Uh, yeah, maybe to some extent. <laughs> Depends on how you do it. So, uh, uh, to provide the outline, what I will be talking about today, is first of all, I will describe my own background, my, the topic of my research, and my own experience. Uh, then I will um, talk a bit about the academic career in general, what you might expect uh, of this you know, path of life, and then uh, what Luxembourg in particular has to offer. So basically that's it. So my name is Sergey, I'm 25, I uh, come from Moscow, Russia, uh, and I um, got my master's degree in applied mathematics from the Moscow State University. You can see the picture of the main building on the, of the university here, uh, and um, I'm a PhD student. I started six months ago in October in the University of Luxembourg. So I can define my research topic as crypto economics. It sounds very fancy and it doesn't have yet a precise definition. I will try to explain it in more detail. Uh, so uh, in 2008, uh, there appeared the system that is called Bitcoin. Did anybody hear about Bitcoin or blockchain, cryptocurrency? So I think somebody have heard of that. So it's, I, I, I can say that it's really a breakthrough in computer science and it, um, for the first time we were able to create some kind of digital cash without any banks. And the technology, the data structure that it is, that it is based on is called the blockchain. So this is a picture of the blockchain. Uh, the, main, the main breakthrough was that the designer of that system uh, cleverly combined cryptography and economics. It's not purely a technical solution, but a solution that combines cryptographic techniques such as hash functions, digital signatures, with economic incentives so that the players who play this game uh, are more or less honest, because it is profitable for them to be honest. So then another system came a few years later, in 2014, it's called Ethereum, and it combined the same ideas from Bitcoin, the distributed database called the blockchain, with the financial contracts that are written in a special programming language. And they are stored and executed in the distributed network of computers, so that no one can shut it off. If you deploy your program to that network, nobody can shut it down. It will always execute as expected, as you programmed it. And without, um, without the need of any trusted party, without the need of any bank or any um, Google or Amazon cloud, you can run programs that always run as intended. Uh, so, this field is very interesting for me because it combines many aspects from many different fields of study. So, first of all, on the ba basis level of this technology is, of course, computer science, namely cryptography. 
so these systems use, of course, cryptographic algorithms like digital signatures, hash functions, encryption, and to develop such algorithms, you have to be knowledgeable in the field of mathematics and low-level programming. So more high-level aspects include network protocols, so how can you connect the computers in that network, how do they exchange messages so that the messages will be relayed to all the computers in the world in a short amount of time, uh, and also the development of new programming languages, because this new field involves a new paradigm of computing, and it involves um, kind of thinking in a new way about the contracts and the financial agreements between some entities that includes programming languages. So, and also economic aspects, of course. Uh, this field is closely related to game theory because uh, we are dealing here with participants who are usually anonymous and who are acting to increase their profit. So the goal is to design a system in such a way that if all the participants uh, act selfishly, only trying to increase the profit that they will receive, the system will be self-sustainable. It will be stable and it will provide the services that it is intended to provide. So, of course, economics uh, also plays here an important role. Uh, like, for every transaction in these systems, you have to pay a fee. So, how do you determine the size of that fee? So, these laws of supply and demand also play a role. Uh, and if you are more into finance and more into counting money and trying to predict where the exchange rate will go, so it's also a, a very uh, large field of opportunity here because here on the graph you can see how the price of Bitcoin changed over the past couple of years and it is sometimes it goes up like crazy, sometimes it falls and for, uh, for a financial analyst that can predict these fluctuations, it's a very good opportunity to make lots of money. Uh, what is interesting from the computer science point of view here is that security is very important. Uh, so basically these networks are open so everyone can participate and um, every mistake, every bug in the code of these systems can cause uh, the loss of, of money. And it happened multiple times when uh, badly programmed uh, applications, which are called smart contracts, which run on these networks. Uh, they had bugs in them, and that caused the owners of the contracts to lose tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the programming environment is not yet developed, so now people are developing new languages, new tools, uh, new uh, techniques to help programmers write these programs in a more secure, secure way. And uh, yes, yeah, very easy to make a mistake that will lead to very bad consequences. Uh, but on the bright side, many promises. It's a very exciting field of study because cryptography meets economics in one system. Very interesting. Uh, it's considered uh, what is called a disruptive technology that will create uh, truly global uh, digital financial systems uh, because when you compare the speed and the ease of sending an email or sending a message in your favorite messenger to whoever you like all around the world and um, how hard it is and how much time it takes to send money with your bank uh, it seems just absurd. It can take days when, we, when the information itself is digital and it takes just seconds to send the information. But for some strange reasons you have to wait days until the transaction settles. So these systems can solve this problem. Uh, and we have this automatically executable agreements between people, which is also very promising. Uh, and the general idea is that uh, programmers, instead of lawyers, will write contracts. Uh, but of course, to get it right, um, research is needed. So that's what I'm trying to, to do. That is the field that I'm trying to contribute to. Uh, so. And to, to switch topics, this is a picture of whiteboard in my office, just to give you an idea what it takes sometimes to read uh, a research paper in this area. It's very useful to draw some lines on the whiteboard, also graphs, to really understand what's going on. So uh, now I'm going to change topics and talk a little bit about the academic career in general.
Uh, so the general timeline is the following. So you become a student, you receive your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, uh, then you become a PhD student, like me, uh, study a few more years, or write your thesis, and get a PhD degree. Uh, then, if you want to continue doing your research, you can um, be employed as a postdoctoral researcher, and then, like, next more advanced steps in academic career are associate professor and ultimately a uh, full professor. So, but it should be mentioned that, of course, at any time, if you like, you can leave academia, go work in industry, maybe return back, like myself, for example, after I obtained my master's degree, then I worked in a uh, commercial information security company for three years, and then I decided that I want to go more to more kind of fundamental, fundamental knowledge, and I went here to Luxembourg to do my PhD. So it's totally possible, and in computer science, these skills are very much, uh, very much applied both in academia and in, in industry. So the advantages, in my personal opinion, of academic career are, among others, the following th things. So creative tasks. Uh, you are working on something really new. You are trying to discover something new. Uh, generally, nobody tells you exactly what to do. You have to figure it out on yourself. So much freedom, but on the other hand, of course, much responsibility. Uh, your colleagues are smart. So uh, that's a very good thing. Uh, in my opinion, you will not, um, I mean, this kind of jokes about your dumb boss that is telling you what to do, you will not relate to it. So the people you are working with are smart, are intelligent, and uh, that's a very good atmosphere to work in. And of course, you got to travel to present at conferences. For example, this picture right here uh, is uh, Malta, where I will be presenting at a conference like in a week or so. Uh, this is another picture. Perhaps the text is too small to read, but I will just like it very much. So imagine this circle is all uh, the human knowledge, and when you go to elementary school, you just learn a little bit in the middle, then you learn in high school a little bit more, then you choose your specialization, you learn, you choose one direction and you go to that direction, and then uh, when you decide to do your PhD, you like on the boundary of human knowledge at one particular tiny piece of knowledge. You push this boundary for a few years, and then this tiny thing right here is your PhD. So uh, it may seem a bit depressing because you are only tiny, a tiny piece of the whole sphere of knowledge. But on the other hand, uh, for me, it's very important that you are really on the on the frontier of human knowledge. You are pushing this boundary, and perhaps in your particular topic, if you decide to do a PhD in, in a few years of your PhD, uh, you will be the most knowledgeable person on earth in this particular small area of knowledge. Uh, sounds pretty cool to me. So, what does the daily life of a researcher look like? You are keeping track of new research, you are reading some articles, some specialized media, what's going on in your field of study, uh, you search for new relevant papers that you're interested in, uh, you read these papers, you discuss it with colleagues, perhaps uh, you organize some kind of internal seminar when you and your colleagues uh, do short informal presentations on what you have read recently and how it uh, compares to other things that you knew or other things that your colleagues are working on. Uh, so then, generally, in, at least in computer science, uh, you have to propose some kind of solution. You see the problem, for example, uh, this algorithm is inefficient, or it is broken, or something is bad with it, I propose in you a better solution, a better algorithm. And usually in computer science, it, inclu it includes programming and testing, so you implement the solution, you see how it works, what are, I don't know, the memory consumption, or CPU consumption, or whatever you are interested in. If it's a cryptographic algorithm, you provide some proofs and some guarantees on how secure it is. Um, you write a paper, obviously, you describe your solution, your positive, negative sides, and so on with analysis. You submit it to a conference or to a workshop or something. If it gets accepted, you prepare a talk, you prepare a presentation, uh, you speak in front of the audience, you discuss it with 
colleagues from another research institutions. Um, and maybe also, as a side note, you can also teach students. I haven't yet had this experience, but may maybe I will. Undergraduate students, some seminars or some help, help professor teach lectures or something like that. So this is how my workplace looks like. Uh, and this pile of papers on the right is what I have read during the past six months. Um, let's talk about Luxembourg. So there is a reason why I chose to go to Luxembourg, not to some other country. Um, and other things is that computer science is really among the key areas that Luxembourg is determined to, to improve. So one of the areas is biological sciences as bioinformatics. And uh, the second one is computer science with a focus on uh, information security. Um, the university, if you decide to go to the university, it is rapidly expanding. As you can see, new buildings are being built and new, uh, new researchers, new PhD students and postdocs are being hired. So the teams are expanding and uh, they are waiting for you. Maybe. Uh, the environment is very international, so according to the data I found on FNR website, I think, 87% of researchers in Luxembourg are foreigners. That means that if you become a researcher, you will get this uh, international network of personal connections with people from all over the world, not necessarily from Europe, but also from Americas and from Asia and from Africa, whatever. Uh, this might be very helpful in your future career. And collaboration with the industry in computer science, uh, especially in this domain of information security slash financial technology. Uh, as you probably know, Luxembourg is among the banking capitals and financial capitals of Europe. And of course, the financial institutions are very much interested in these emerging technologies. And for example, this is the example of industry collaboration. Just like two weeks ago, it was announced that PayPal and um, the Research Foundation of Luxembourg and University of Luxembourg are organizing what they call a chair in digital financial services, so some kind of organization that will improve the research in financial technology and apply it and implement it inside the real commercial company. So the collaboration might be very fruitful and very profitable at the end. So basically that's the end of my presentation. Here are some links. The Research Foundation of Luxembourg, the site of the university, uh, this uh, website about science in Luxembourg, cryptolux.org is the website of our research group, and the last uh, line is my personal website where you can uh, see links to my personal pages and information about me. So I'm happy to answer your questions.